Hi, and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech, the weekly Q&A session. Uh, today we've got the double act. So ask us some questions down there. Don't forget you can also get ask us uh, individual questions about bikes and bike related stuff. Uh, keep it on the tech side and we might put you on next week's show or the one after. Uh, I'm gonna dive in first if you don't mind. Uh, so we've got a question from Danny Salas who says, hey, I've got an off topic question. Maybe you can help. I've had my bike in my detached garage, which, or garage, uh, which gets water on the floor from time to time. It's been cold the past weeks and rainy lots. I noticed the bike feeling wet from humidity and moisture. Will it damage it if I leave it in there for the winter? Um, well, you, you could argue that water will sit on the bike as long as it's lubricated in theory and it's not getting you know, constantly wet. It should be fine. I mean, I've got a bike that lives in the garden and it's absolutely fine. Um, you've got to bear in mind though, uh, there are products out there that are going to make things a bit easier for you. So what you want is some kind of water displacing spray that's got sort of lubricant qualities to it. If you cover your transmission in it and anything that's got moving parts like the derailleur, uh, maybe if you've got SPD or clipless pedals, the linkages on those, basically the clip mechanism, and it wouldn't do any harm to spray some around any sort of pivot points. Obviously avoid your brakes at all costs uh, and just treat it basically as a waterproof barrier. Um, before you ride, you might want to give the bike a bit of a wipe down, put some fresh lube on it, but really, bikes are pretty good. Uh, if you've got any steel parts on there, they're likely to get surface corrosion on them. So a good contender is your, your stem bolt, based on the top, the top cap one. So a bit of lube in there as well. Um, put a blanket over it is an idea. A waterproof cover, you can get them cheap on Amazon and places like that. But to be fair, unless it's directly in rain, um, and a bike I've got in the garden, I've had it as a bit of a test actually. It is one I don't ride much, but I've been testing out some different products on it and I'm, I'm amazed it's not got any rust on it. Like it's, it's ridiculous and it's been out there for over a year. Yeah, uh, technology these days yeah. is pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I've got a question from Efri Brewer who says, can you convert an old rim brake bike to disc brakes uh, if the frame does not have disc brake mounts? I have seen some welded hack jobs, uh, but not sure if it's worth it. The frame is a 97 Kona cinder cone that I want to convert into nice. a gravel bike. Oh, that was a cool bike, wasn't it? Even yeah. in 97. Um, I mean, that cinder cone is a steel frame. So, I mean, technically it would be one of the easier metals to work with but if you're not familiar with welding it makes me a bit nervous to do home welding if you're not confident with it but you can take it to potentially a welder to get them to do it or maybe a frame builder might do it for you it's worth asking around to see what the price is anyway if you're really serious about this um, alternatively if you're buying all new wheels anyway um, and you're doing a little conversion maybe you're gonna for a gravel bike you might be buying um, new forks anyway I wonder if you could try just convert in the front first to see if that is good enough. Um, I did this with my own Kona Nunu back in 2001. Well, it was in 2008 with my 2001 Nunu, which was rim brake, and I got a disc front wheel and changed the forks to accommodate uh, the disc caliper on those forks and see if that's good enough stopping power. Um, I guess my question is, is it not enough now? Because um, if it's not, then maybe play around with that first, as it's gonna be quite difficult to find uh, a disc rear wheel for something like a 97 uh, cinder cone anyway. Uh, so maybe experiment. What do you think? Yeah, why not? I think you've got nothing to lose. Go for it, steel frame. If you're willing to experiment with it, yeah, it'd be cool. Get on with it. Um, next up is from the bizarre, I'm not even gonna read out your name, F1.8, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Dottie and Anna, I've got a Marzocchi Bomber Z2 fork with the rail damper uh, um, on my Marin Rift Zone bike. Been riding for a year now, not as much as I would have liked due to injury, considering a fork service. Marzocchi suggests a full rebuild every 125 hours or yearly. Full rebuild seems challenging. I've seen your vids on lower leg service, which seems easy enough to do DIY. Would doing a lower leg service make sense? Um, or does a rail system with that quasi open bath always require a full rebuild? Well, to be fair, it doesn't sound like you've probably ridden it as much as they suggest. So they say annually, uh, but they're really referring to how much you've actually ridden a bike. So when I say 125 hours, no, when I say 125 hours, that'll be 125 hours of saddle time on the bike. So uh, to be fair, it's probably okay. So I think you wrote this, like two and a half hours a week for a year. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's sensible mileage to look after the product, but if you haven't done it, it's probably gonna be all right. A lower leg service is something that I do recommend people uh, obviously take great care if you're gonna do it at home, but it is an easily achievable job to do at home. It's not really that difficult. Uh, you just have to be sensible, use the correct tools and the correct oils. 
Now, the cool thing with that damper, as you're mentioning, so it's almost a quasi open bath, it's a little bit different to the grip damper that you see on the Fox equivalent of the similar fork. It does rely on having a bit more oil on the lower leg and it circulates that oil kind of like open bath forks used to. Uh, and because of the way it works, it actually looks after that damper quite well. So I'm almost certain your damper won't need doing. Um, I've, to be honest, I've not worked on one of those dampers, but I do have a Z1 with a similar style damper on the inside of that. So I'm actually gonna pull that one apart and have a look at that in the new year. But I think you'll probably be absolutely fine um, with a lower leg surface, if at all, to be fair. And the Marzocchi stuff generally is pretty good, uh, but don't run it until it's, you know, until it's dead. Definitely be doing the right approach to take care of it. And then Doug Bikes CLE says, I find it interesting that Anna says to use a dry lube for cabling in this particular video, yet Doddy recently said to use wet lube in his video about how to change cables and housing. Is this one of those some do this, some do that types <laughs> of scenarios? <gasps> Have we conflicted? Oh my days. They're both lubricants at the end of the day. <laughs> the only difference between them is the, the dry one, obviously the wet part of it evaporates, leaving the lubricated part where you want it. Um, I just put wet in because I ride in a lot of wet conditions, basically, so it makes more sense to me. I think in my brain, dry lube is just a little more viscous, so it was going to go all the way down the chain, but that might not necessarily be the case. Um, maybe something like a maintenance spray, like a PT17, which is, it will it will be water dispersant, but it'll add a really light uh, lubrication to it as well. And if you get one of those little straws, it'll be easier to squirt down. Probably easier than lube, but the answer is, yeah, it is kind of those some use this some use that maybe just use whatever you've got available next question and this is a biggie so this is from nicholas he says you mentioned anti-squat here uh, but how does it actually work is it geometry i can't see how the derailleur can control the shock right Okay, so this is a phenomenon that occurs from the position of the pivots on the bike it's not a physical thing like a lever on the shock or anything and due to the way that every frame is slightly different, the configuration of these things, there's varying amounts on here. So for example, so high anti-squat, what you're essentially doing is you're using the chain to control the squat, which is weight transfer at the end of the day. If you liken it to a car, if, you, if you're on a big squashy suspension car and you accelerate away from traffic lights, the car's gonna lean back into itself, yeah? Your bike will do exactly the same when you go and pedal it, basically. You get the weight transfer and it's accentuated by you pedaling. So what the designers do is they try and use the chain tension on the bike to control the amount of the bike squats when you pedal. Yeah, so this is known as anti-squat. So you get high anti-squat and you get low anti-squat. So I'll start in reverse here, even though I've kind of put some points down. Um, a low anti-squat number, what that means is when you pedal, the suspension's gonna compress. Yeah, so that's not efficient. But as an upside, the suspension will feel really active and really good. Whereas the complete opposite can be said with a high anti-squat number. So I'm just gonna throw a shot on screen of an old Cannondale that I filmed with uh, at some point last year. Uh, now this bike had a really high pivot, it's really high above that chain line. And because it doesn't have an idler wheel that you see on normal bikes that give the suspension the effect of um, having a lower pivot, what it means basically is when you pedal that bike, the suspension will extend. So complete opposite. So that is a very high anti-squat number. I don't know what the number is on that bike. Let's just say it's 150% uh, ridiculously harsh. So as you pedal, it completely locks out and the suspension won't move, which means it's gonna be a really harsh bike. Uh, you know, the complete opposite there. But you've got to bear in mind that suspension designers are trying to achieve a lot of different things at the same time. You know, the strive between an active suspension system, high anti-squat, you've also got like anti-rise, which is the braking effects of which you get extension and compression within that as well. You've got loads of different things. So anti-squat is just one part of it. Uh, and it is referred to a lot because it's directly responsible for how the bike feels when you pedal and we all do that, of course. So what you're looking for in an ideal world is an anti-squat number that's pretty high. 100% um, anti-squat, by the way, would, would mean your pedaling forces are countered by the suspension, so your pedaling will be neutral. So high anti-squat in your lower gears is a really good thing, and slightly less in your higher gears. So the smaller gears where you're pedaling faster, you're going over bumpier terrain. If you've got something around 80%, for example, uh, that's a real good sweet spot to be in. But like I said, there's a massive topic, and no one bike, even with similar numbers, will feel quite the same. You know, even things like chain stair length will affect this dramatically. Uh, it's, it's a big one. Mm, and there's fair. no right and wrong, is there? Different no. people would prefer different yeah. feeling. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I've got a question here from um, Geordie Craig 101 who said, Hey, Daddy and Anna. Hey, son. 
<laughs> Didn't know you could talk yet. I'm looking to replace my XT 12 speed 10 tooth to 51 tooth cassette, but the only ones I can find are the XTR ones, and those are a tad expensive. Are there any good alternative ones you can suggest? Cheers. Okay, so a lot of people are going to say, well, what about non branded ones? Um, and what about SRAM as well? Um, I would say if you've got a uh, Shimano Hyperglide chain and you're sticking with that, um, some the Hyperglide has a slightly different width to uh, many cassettes out there, including SRAM, because they're designed to work with Hyperglide cassettes, which means that you might get a bit of chain suck and they might not change so well on SRAM and non-Hyperglide cassettes. Um, however, I could just draw your attention to the other Shimano cassette range, which should be compatible. Um, you, you're looking at um, XT, uh, which is around about 150 pounds, and you don't want to go up to XTR. Then what about the SLX or even the Dior? So the difference here is that XT has two aluminium rings at the back there for a bit of lightweightness. Um, it's not as light as the XTR, which has even aluminium and high uh, titanium components to it to make it even lighter and that's why it's so expensive. But if you drop down to SLX, um, then that has one aluminium cog instead of two, like with the XT, but you'll be spending about 100 pounds to 115 pounds. So if you don't mind losing one aluminium cog, uh, then you'll be saving about 50 pounds if you go for them. And then even more uh, value oriented is the Dior cassette, which is four full steel, no aluminium rings, would be about 80 or 90 pounds. Uh, it will wear slow so if you're into big value, then um, a full steel cassette uh, will wear a little um, slower, uh, but it does add about 100 grams onto your existing XT cassette that you're used to. So weigh up whether you want ease and wearing, maybe rock that in the winter if it's terrible conditions where you are, and then go back to XT when things get a bit better in summer. Okay, and last question, um, another biggie. This one's from Tim Sadler, who's a local basically uh, in our realms. He watches everything. Good to see you again. So he says, Doddy, you dropped the trunnion shock knowledge there. So what are the pros and cons versus a normal mount? All right, so this, again, this is another massive subject, so let's keep this pretty quick. Right, so this is a regular shock with regular mounts, so you've got two eyes at either end. The trunnion mount, you have basically, uh, you don't have that mount at the top. This shock body will be bigger and you'll have holes directly in the shock to mount it to the frame. Now, the trunnion mount is kind of in its second life. So we actually saw this in the 90s to start with and it was there for a different reason. You'd have a shock and the trunnion mount, what it enabled was the shock to spin up and down basically within that mount to change the bottom bracket height and the geometry of the bikes. Best example I can think of to illustrate that is GT LTS, the one that had the titanium link on the back. Uh, very cool. But then later on, uh, it, may, it resurfaced again for a different reason. Now, of course, what you're seeing on a lot of bikes is people mounting it and uh, using the bearings in the upper link there, which is a great benefit from it because you get a nice sensitive stroke. But the real benefit to having a trunnion mount is to essentially, um, I guess, simplify shock mountings. So it used to be a free fall from suspension designers and frame manufacturer point of view. People would design the frame and be like, oh cool, I need, I need to spec a shock of this size to fit it. So you would end up with some shocks in a range, even if it was the same equivalent shock uh, to a bigger, physically bigger one, um, and there would be inconsistencies in how they behaved. So you could end up with a shock that had a very small eye to eye, and therefore the actual body of the shock would be quite small. So you'd have less oil in there, and all the gubbins on the inside were basically struggling to give the same consistency as the exact same model of shock in a longer size. So what the metric system was uh, essentially to simplify the shock mounting. So they, you had less mountings and then you'd have a trunnion shock. So the trunnion shock would be in place of a shorter shock, but the body remained the same length as some of the longer shocks, if that makes sense. So you're basically getting the same performance on a shock with less space in it by giving it a bit more space with a different mounting system on there. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Kind of does in my weird backwards head the way I talk about things. Mm, and breathe. You had some meaty topics there, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the end of the show as well. And if you have any questions of your own, don't forget to use hashtag AskGMBNTech down in the comments below of any of our videos, actually. And then we can find that question and put you on a show like this. But thanks for watching for now. Ta-ra!